I had a job until a full-time job until I was 31 years old, but 41 now. So I've been working in the industry full-time for 10 years. I always was fully committed to, to doing comics, you know, and you'll find that the people like you going to the Cuber school now, Ken, you'll see those kids that stop drawing for too long and they regress or stop drawing and disappear. The only thing that the people that don't make it have in common, all of them have in common, is they end up quitting or getting discouraged or getting distracted or doing other things. Even when I had a full-time job, all of my vacation time was spent going to shows. All of my extra money I was getting was buying drafting tables, buying light boxes, buying the newest equipment, buying Adobe Photoshop, learning how to color. I was using the job to supplement my comic book creating career, you know, like I was right. all in, you know, and so I don't know if you can make it if you don't go all in. I think you need a balanced life, obviously, and then figure out what comics is going to be for you going all the way, you know. Nick, to kind of go back just a little bit, before you were entering all those contests and everything, were you making comics and stuff before that? Or were you kind of just maybe doing like more pinup stuff and entering those in? And then that kind of led to the comic pages competitions? Or were you were you drawing like pages and stuff before that? I never drew my own story. I would always search out sample pages, like sample scripts online. Like Brian Michael Bendis had a Ultimate Spider-Man script that floated around or somebody had, someone had a Batman script. How I broke in was um, I would work on those sequentials and those sequentials would train me, right? Like, okay, now I've got to draw Batman running through a room. I've got to know perspective now. I've got to learn anatomy now. I've got to learn. And really, I use perspective to teach me how to plug in the shapes. And yeah, I would use my vacation time at work. And every six months, three months, I would do another three or four page sample. And I would eat, try to level up every time. And it, it might have been me redrawing pages 10 times, you know, and then whenever I finally started, people started like, oh, $50 a page, $100 a page. It was still wasn't enough money or the projects weren't interesting enough for me to really stick with it or do them, you know, so mm. I never really broke in that way. And then I kept doing the samples more intricately with better work. And then with the comic book idol book, uh, that was. The loser of that contest, there was 200 entries and you could see them because it was a forum and you could see it. And I, I, I entered that. They were going to pick 10 contestants to compete against each other. And the winner got like a pinup in an image book or something like that. If you made it to the end and they had a, it was a weekly contest. You had to do like three to four pages a week for like six weeks. Wow. So it was a lot. It was a lot of work. So I like yeah. just took off of work and just did it all. Right. But the the. uh Every week they had a new guest judge, and one was Ryan Otley from Invincible. One was Phoebe Sobolski, uh, just a few different random people in the industry. And uh, that was the first time I really had to stop and like, can I do three pages in a week? You know, and right. luckily I could. I could at that point. I had to pull all nighters and lose my mind. <laughs> and then um, I ended up coming in fifth because you were like voted online, you voted off online or whatever. It was online voting. And then the same day, I felt really good. I was really proud of myself because I had done so much work and put mm -hmm. so much into it, though. And uh, that day, I got an email from Marvel. And they said, this guy, new writer named Jonathan Hickman, wanted to work with me. I don't know if you all know Hickman's work, but at the time, he had only done the Nightly News at Image. And I don't know if you've ever read the Nightly News, no. but it's all like infographics. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, really? so I, yeah, I went I and bought that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I remember the first time I opened up Black, Black Monday Murders, and I'm just like, oh, God. What am I? Getting? Yeah. 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 So I did the same. I'm like, this guy must love Frank quietly and Seth Fisher and Jeff Darrow. If he wants to work with me and I go to the, the comic shop, I buy nightly news and it's even more in infographics. It's like all infographics. And I was like, dude, the main character of this book is a pie chart. <laughs> you know, like it's, you know, like it's, but then I called him. I, I wrote Marvel. I was like, man, this guy's changing my life. You know, he wants to work with me. So I got his number from, uh john barber who is the editor at marvel and then called up hickman and i was like man i just want to thank you man you this is a dream come true you changed my life and uh he's like oh we're gonna do awesome work together you know and he was like no big deal so i actually got to see john i hadn't seen him in like six years i saw him in new york comic-con he came he was like not a guest but he was roaming around so he he played he had some big big meetings in new york or whatever but he popped in the show to say hi so i got to give him a big hug tell him i love him and you know he did he changed my life so 
Nice. Cool, dude. That's awesome. So that's kind of how I that's how I got my first gig. My first real published work was uh, Marvel Comics Presents. I got like a 48 page story in that that ran for I think eight, six to eight issues. Yeah, six issues, eight pages an issue, something like that. Mm. So nice. And was 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 that kind of the moment that you switched to full time? Or what or did it come No, out? no, no. No, like me and Hickman bounced around some other ideas. I had started getting some other offers or a lot of tryouts. And Mar once Marvel saw my pages, they kind of circulated at the other offices and they would like, you want to try out for this or that? I tried out for a few things, but I was going to school. I got my teaching degree from the University of Houston. So I uh, got my minor in education. And yeah, so um, I did that and I was finishing that. So I was working at Marvel and like going to art classes at University of Houston. And then I had a really great couple, really great teachers there. Um, uh, oddly enough, the teacher's last name was Hickman also. And uh, he ended up he ended up giving me a scholarship and offering me to teach the illustration class while I was still like going there, you know? So that was pretty cool. And um, yeah, it was, it was cool. Like I love the, I love, I know it's a competition with yourself, but I actually love the competition of like, I want to draw and write a better story than you. I want to draw in those art classes. I want to draw a, a drawing that's going to be better than everybody's. I, lo I used to love those critique days and stuff. I think, yeah, you know, I know you guys might have a PG show, but pulling it out on pulling it out and putting it on the table sometimes is cool too, right? <laughs> you know, like showing it off. You know, show what you got. There's yep. like a I love I love Growing sports. <laughs> I love sports. You guys are unmonetized now, so you're welcome. Uh, but. Uh, but yeah, I love sports. I love competition. And then there's that part of you that, and I want to chase those guys down. You know, I, I, I know I'll never catch some of the guys that I follow. They're just too amazing, but I do want to be, uh, I want them to know who I am. You know, like I got to meet Raphael Grample at New York Comic Con and that trick about John being yeah. my icon kind of worked because he, uh, as I was waiting in line, I was going to bring him a book. There was a lot of foreign artists in New in your Comic Con and, I think I have a European style, you know, so they're kind of slightly attracted to it. Mm. So I had the book and I saw his handler was looking at the book before I got there. And then I handed it to him and he's like, I know you, you're the guy with the chop. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, like he knows, he knows of John, you know, he doesn't know right. me, but he knows of John. And I'm like, dude, that's, that's the goal, right? Getting to a place mentally where you're not having to, and you guys are doing this now. But a lot of us that were trying to climb the big two ladder, mm -hmm. we're looking for approval from editors. And those editors, I'm 41 years old. Some of them are 25, 26. No offense to them, <laughs> but I'm not at a I'm not in a position where when I come up with a story that I want, I'm not gonna go ask someone for permission to make my art. You know, I just don't right. believe in that, you know. And so with Axe when I made it, um, Thank you, yeah. Justin. Thank Justin you. Justin over here um, saying that there's there's some great stuff going on here. <laughs> yeah, I was just below me. It was beneath. I guess I'll say it this way: it was beneath me to ask another person if it's okay to make my art. You know, like it, it, like that was so out of the realm of possibility for me that I was just going to start working on John and make the book because the way the story came to me is my first daughter was born and she got sick. Um, she ended. We ended up having to live in the Ronald McDonald house. I'm doodling. I come up with this character. The character comes to me like in my time of need and when my career's on pause and I'm like, man, I'm going to make something of this character. I'm going to make this moment mean something in my life. And I wasn't going to leave that hospital. My daughter's fine now, but I wasn't going to leave that hospital as a artist. Basically, it's kind of like with the story of John is John's this brutal killer. And he's this thief and he's this kind of sinner. And then he gets this opportunity to be everything he's been, but for the right reason, he gets a great reason to kill. Right. Yeah. And I thought that's a great story. And I started writing that story out. But then I thought for me as an artist, this is God saying, all right, all right, artist, you think you're an artist, you, you go say something, then go take what you've learned about being a new dad or life or what you learned from your father or mentors or whatever and put it into a book and say something actually say something don't draw someone else's story what's your story you know who's your character and i was very confident and very bold about coming home and working on that 
And there was no piece of me that was going to ask another person on this planet if it was okay to make my art, you know? And I was right. just, just dead, I was dead set on that. And then of course it comes with all the other problems. Like, how do I get it out there? How do I, you know, like yeah. it's a, that's a world of new problems, but being free of that, like must be, must glad hand must be r- nice to the right people. And just saying, you know, fuck it. I'm doing my thing was the best feeling in the world. There's, there's no better feeling than that, you know? And right. then I felt for the first time I was really creating what can be considered art, you know, which is Mobius says you, an artist encodes the world around them. So everything you've absorbed and take it in and then spit it back out through your hand through craft the best you can and say something, you know, and what, and what does that say about you and about the people around you? And hopefully it's, you've absorbed enough stuff to where it's still popular and not just the strangest shit ever. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like you want it to be marketable, but um, I don't know. I, I really like uh, there was something about the design of John too, with him, you know, John's this really machismo character so and I always associate, <laughs> yeah, I always associate mustaches with machismo, but there's something in the story where he's taken down a peg. So I thought I'm going to break that mustache in half. I was like, you know what? I'm going to break, his whole face in half, you know, I'm going to cut his whole face in half. And I thought he, most people wouldn't do that. They're like kind of soft with a light scar or a bridge of the nose or something. But yeah. I was like, no, I'll take a main character and make him a two face. I will destroy him. And I liked, I really liked that. There's some characters in, you know, like I really like what I got from my kids was they look at me and they see, they don't see a fat guy. They see the strongest man in the world. Mm-hmm. They don't see a, fat cartoonist that's too lazy sometimes but they see like a literal god walking around amongst them you know when i walk into the room right and i wanted a character that you could prejudge with john like you look at him and you can judge me like oh it's going to be over violent it's going to be gross it's going to be whatever but then use that as a halloween mask to really hide a great heartfelt message you know like i I think art in a way can be like playing halloween like you can you can hide these, you know, anth- through behind anthropomorphic characters like Nico does or go violent shooter superhero. You're just putting a mask on a moral play that, that if that's that heart is there and that morality tell is there, that's universal. You can put any kind of aesthetic on it. You can put stick figures, you can put bloody no faced man. You can put anything you want. And uh, so I, I think in a real way, we're just putting a new coat on an old tale you know and uh that's what i that's what i kind of realized when i was creating john so <laughs>